This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. I'm old enough to remember a time before the internet. In fact, that's when I spent the most impressionable years of my life. I was, I was molded by that time period before the internet as we know it changed the world as we know it. And sometimes I find myself fascinated with Gen Z because they were brought up in a time with the internet. They were molded by an era in which all the entertainment and information you could ever want is always available at all times. And I do worry about the misinformation on the internet and you know what that does to somebody who develops their worldview in a hurricane of, of clickbait and misinformation and deep fakes and conspiracy theories. Like you hope that somebody who grows up amongst that might be a bit more savvy about it because they've never really known a world in which you could just take information at face value. So they're, they're more aware of the manipulation and aren't as taken by it. Or could growing up in a time of information chaos lead somebody to just abandon the entire concept of truth? and just the loudest voices win. You want it to be the first one. And then you find out that there's a growing conspiracy theory amongst Gen Zers that birds aren't real. And then you start to worry that it's the second one. Only you would be wrong, because it's actually the first one. Birds Aren't Real is a satirical movement that claims that birds aren't really animals, but actually government drones there to spy on you. They've been showing up at protests around the country, putting up billboards in major cities, and driving around in vans covered with conspiracy lingo. But Birds Aren't Real isn't real. It's a parody, and its whole point is to highlight the absurdity of all the conspiracy theories that seem to be taking over the country. Like any good satire, it walked the line to where if you're not in on the joke, you might not really get that it's a joke. But for the people who are in on the joke, it, it serves as a kind of release, a way to thumb their nose at this dangerously destabilizing thing that is taking over this world that they're inheriting. And it kind of backs up the old adage that you can't really reason with crazy, you just have to out-crazy them. Oh, so you think JFK Jr. is going to return from the dead and take over the world from the spot where his father was murdered? Okay, well, I don't think birds are real. Top that. Like, people always say that if you encounter somebody who doesn't believe that we landed on the moon, you should just out-crazy them by saying, oh, <laughs> you believe in the moon? Except there are actually people who think that the moon is not an actual moon, but it's actually some kind of space station for aliens, so... <sighs> on July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 lander touched down on the lunar surface. It was watched live by 652 million people around the world, which was one-fifth of the whole total world population at the time. And here we are now, some 50 years later, and 11% of the United States population either strongly believes or somewhat believes that the moon landings were faked. That's like 40 million people. But here's the thing. That's nothing new. In fact, a poll by Night Newspapers just a year after the Apollo 11 landing showed that already millions of Americans didn't quite believe it had happened. The major reasons that people gave was that they thought that the U.S. just made it up to fool the communists or to justify the expense of the space program. And this was written about by self-published author Bill Casing in his book, We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 Billion Swindle in 1976. <sighs> yeah, this was one of the first books that really caught on in the moon hoax community. And uh, I mean, I can kind of understand why people felt that way. I mean, this was the early 70s at the height of the Cold War and Vietnam and Watergate had just totally shattered Americans' faith in their government. So, I mean, the idea that the moon landings were this shiny object that they were dangling in front of people to distract them from what was really going on. I mean, I get it. You know, for some people, it was just easier for them to believe that they'd been lied to than that we had actually landed on the moon. And of course, once you believe in a conspiracy theory, you just see proof of that conspiracy theory everywhere you look. And one of the things that the moon landing deniers kind of glommed onto was the Van Allen belts. If the Earth is surrounded by intense radiation, then there's no way they went to the moon. Busted! This has been one of the biggest pieces of evidence that moon landing deniers refer to. And I've been I've seen it brought up in my comments a million different times, even though it's been disproven a thousand different ways. Um, it just seems to be one of these stickier elements of the conspiracy that just never seems to go away. And I think that's because there is an element of truth to it. You know, the Van Allen belts are real and they are dangerous. But pretty much everything about the Apollo missions were dangerous. And they were only overcome by the grit and genius and sheer determination of the NASA engineers and the astronauts. Like they literally just problem solved their way to the moon. And I think that's why this conspiracy theory is so aggravating because it's just completely pissing all over the work and determination of hundreds of thousands of people that came together to make this one amazing human feat possible. 
And I mean, it's so cynical because like we have this one great thing, we have one thing and you just gotta sh Sorry, that was, that was off topic. So yeah, back to the Van Allen belts. The belts are named after astrophysicist James Van Allen, who was a cosmic ray expert from the University of Iowa. In the late 50s, he worked with his graduate students to develop a cosmic ray instrument, which included a Geiger counter that could register protons and electrons above a minimum energy. Rocketry was still in its earliest years, and they were hoping to launch this thing up into space so that they could get an idea of what radiation looks like above our atmosphere. This proved to be a challenge. But not so much a technological one, but a political one. This was in the pre-NASA days, when rocketry was really in the hands of the military, and the various branches of the military were all competing with each other to be the first to get into space. The main competitors were the Army and the Air Force, and they each had a secret weapon in their corner. The Air Force had the U.S. Secretary of Defense on their side. He wanted them to be the ones that designed the rockets. And the Army had Nazis! Guess who won? Specifically Werner von Braun, who, yes, was a Nazi, but he was also a genius. So the Army was actually making great strides with Werner von Braun leading things, but uh, they ran into all this political red tape because the DoD wanted the Air Force to succeed and everything was just kind of stymied. But on October 4th, 1957, things changed. The first Soviet satellite Sputnik 1 was put into orbit, and the second those beeps and boops started sounding over American heads, well, that clarified some things. The Defense Department fell in line behind von Braun and the Army, and they gave him all the resources they need to put a satellite into orbit. And to distance the project from military goals, uh, in the public eye at least, they decided that the first satellite that they would put up would be a civilian satellite, one without any military objectives. And Von Braun was given a deadline of 90 days to make this happen, so he didn't really care what he put up there. He just needed a satellite, something that was ready to go. And one satellite that was ready to go was Van Allen's Cosmic Ray instrument. So it was picked up and renamed Explorer 1. Just real quick side note, Van Allen himself was actually in Antarctica when this news came down, so he actually called up one of his grad students, a guy named George Ludwig, and asked him to deliver the satellite, which he did in the back of his car. He literally loaded up his pregnant wife and two young daughters into his car and drove 1,600 miles with Explorer 1, the first American satellite to ever go into space, in the trunk of his car. But I guess it paid off because he was later named a chief research scientist at NASA, so... Good show, old chap. So anyway, Explorer 1 went up on January 31st, 1958. It became the first American satellite in space, so we were officially a part of the space race, and there was much rejoicing. But while Americans were high-fiving each other over this accomplishment, James Van Allen and his team were going over the data that was coming back from this satellite. And this is not when the Van Allen belts were discovered. Actually, they were really disappointed with the data that was coming back, because like half of it was missing. Where readings should have been, there were big long gaps in the data where no particles were being detected. And they couldn't figure out why. So for Explorer 2, they added a magnetic recorder to keep a log of everything that was going on. Previously, they'd just kind of been reading it live. And this is not when they discovered it because Explorer 2 blew up, but Explorer 3, ha <laughs> Explorer 3. This one went up in March of 1958 and everything worked perfectly. Same as the first time, there were gaps where they weren't picking up anything, but this time they were able to pin down specific locations in orbit where these gaps were taking place. And at the same time, they ran some tests on one of the ground-based cosmic ray instruments, and they found out that if they flooded it with x-rays, it could kind of simulate the same effect that they were getting up in space. In other words, it wasn't that it wasn't picking up any particles, it's that it was being swarmed by too many particles, and it just kind of shut the whole thing down. And this is where they figured out that there was an intense belt of radiation around the Earth. This was how they found the Van Allen belts. So, what to do with this information? Let me think. Radiation belts around the planet. Intense x-rays. Hmm. Let's nuke it. <sighs> yeah. The U.S. nuked the Van Allen belts in 1962. It was actually a part of a series of five atmospheric tests with nuclear weapons because that's something that we just used to do. But one particular test was called Starship Prime. Real, that, that was its actual name. And it was aimed at the Van Allen belts. They were testing to see if they could use the belts to create sort of a radiation shield to prevent missile attacks on ground-based locations below. Uh, it didn't work, but the EMP from the blast did manage to knock out one-third of the satellites that were currently in orbit. So the Van Allen belts are composed of two main belts of particles with a gap in between. The inner belt extends from about 600 kilometers to nearly 10,000 kilometers above Earth's surface, and it's made mostly of protons. 
Some have been stripped away by solar wind by the Earth's magnetic field, while others were supplied by the upper atmosphere. The outer belt stretches from about 13,500 kilometers to nearly 60,000 kilometers, but this is highly variable and kind of depends on how you measure it. The outer belt especially can swell at times as low energy electrons and other particles rush in, but that diminishes gradually, sometimes in a few minutes, sometimes it takes days. And there are still a lot of questions around exactly how the belts work, but we do know some of the basics. So yeah, basically the Earth's magnetic field captures these particles and then funnels them around the planet in these rings, kind of in the same way that particle accelerators and fusion reactors use magnetic fields to confine a plasma. It's just sort of the same idea. But recent measurements by NASA's Van Allen probe show that uh, it's actually a lot more dynamic than we first thought. Like in one observation period, they saw that a solar storm had caused a surge in the size of the Van Allen belt. But then five days after the energy dissipated, there was suddenly another surge, and it didn't correspond with any solar flares. They don't really know where it came from. The Van Allen probes also revealed the existence of a third belt, briefly. This one popped up in what they call the slot region between the inner and outer belts in 2012. It apparently existed for four weeks, and then a shockwave from the sun kind of dissipated it, and it was never seen again. So yeah, the belts are super dynamic. They can grow and change according to solar activity and apparently other things we don't understand. And they are powerful. So, I mean, any conspiracy theorist that says that the Van Allen belts are dangerous, they're not wrong about that. But are they deadly? Studies have shown that inside a typically shielded satellite, an astronaut might receive about as much radiation in an hour in the belts as a normal person would receive in 18 months. This is about the same dose of radiation that was endured by some Japanese atomic bomb survivors. Scary, sure, but notice I said survivors. A deadly dose of radiation is actually far higher than that. So, okay, talking about radiation measurements gets kind of tricky because there's several different measurements that scientists use and they don't really correspond with each other or, or you know, convert to each other very well. But let's stick with sieverts because that one is actually the one that measures damage done to living tissue. Symptoms of radiation poisoning show up at around 400 millisieverts, and 2,000 millisieverts can be fatal, although a person can survive double that with the right treatment. I don't recommend you try this. So with that in mind, our hypothetical astronaut that I was talking about in a typically shielded spacecraft earlier would receive about six millisieverts per hour. So, not too bad. But there is a catch, because small doses of radiation can build up over time. According to the FDA, doses between 5 and 20 millisieverts of ionized radiation can increase your risk for cancer. And a typical CT scan can deliver a dose somewhere in that range, which is why doctors don't use them very often. So look, obviously you wouldn't want to hang out in the Van Allen belts any longer than you'd have to. Thankfully, rockets go really fast. So when we talk about how NASA minimized the risk of the astronauts, the first thing that they did was minimize the amount of time that they spend there. When the Apollo astronauts hit the inner belt, they were traveling at around 38,000 kilometers per hour, which means that they spent around two and a half hours going through the belts. Not great, not terrible. But that's not all they did to reduce their exposure. Long before Apollo 11, Van Allen and his team had mapped out the radiation belts, and they found that there were some areas that were stronger than others. So they didn't go through there. Yes, they developed a complicated maneuver that they called um, going around it. Go that way, really fast. If something gets in your way, turn. The trajectory took it in the direction of magnetic north away from the densest region of high energy particles. The next precaution that they took had to do with the command module. Remember earlier when I mentioned how much radiation astronauts would receive in a typically shielded satellite? Well, they weren't in a typically shielded satellite. And one of the mandatories of the Apollo command module was that it should be engineered to survive what at the time was the biggest solar flare ever recorded. So special materials and coatings in the hull, water shielding, and even the suits that the astronauts wore provided a little bit of protection. And one last thing that NASA did was they monitored for solar events. Like I said before, the size and strength of the belts fluctuate quite a bit, usually along with solar activity. So NASA created the Solar Particle Alert Network, which carefully monitored solar activity leading up to the missions. Yeah, they advised NASA on periods of high solar activity so that they can get the astronauts into the more shielded areas of the spacecraft should an emergency arise, which thankfully they didn't have to do on any of the Apollo missions. Although there was a close call between Apollo 16 and 17 where the radiation in the belts went up to 4,000 millisieverts. But even if there had been some astronauts caught in that, the shielding would have probably reduced it down to around 350 millisieverts, which one NASA executive said is the difference between a bone marrow transplant and a headache. And we actually know exactly how much radiation the Apollo astronauts received because they all wore dosimeters from launch to splashdown. And because of all the efforts I just listed, the highest radiation dose that anybody received was 1.4 rad on Apollo 14. 
Now, like I said before, RADs don't really convert to sieverts very well, but for example, 70 RAD is considered radiation poisoning, and around 120 RAD can be fatal. So long story short, the Van Allen belts are not nearly as dangerous as the conspiracy theorists want to believe. NASA was well aware of them long before Apollo 11, and they took the proper precautions to avoid the worst of it. Of course, if you're dedicated to the conspiracy, none of this matters. These are all just lies made up by people trying to perpetuate the fraud, and anybody and everybody who has anything to say against it is now in on the conspiracy, including me. But when it comes down to it, the Van Allen belts are just one of many different dangers involved in spaceflight, from everything from thermal management to orbital debris. They definitely put a limit to the altitude on crewed missions, but they're not any danger to the ISS. They're hundreds of kilometers below it. In fact, those dosimeters on the Apollo astronauts showed that they probably received about twice as much radiation while they were on the moon than most astronauts do in low Earth orbit. So you might say that the Van Allen belts are a small price to pay for the protection of Earth's magnetic field. Moon hoaxers, of course, would go on to point at any of the other hundreds of pieces of evidence that have all been debunked a million different ways. I'm not going to spend any time on that. As Artemis goes back to the moon, I'm sure these are going to flare up all over again. But I, for one, choose to celebrate the moon landing. And instead of focusing on all the things that might disprove it, I'm going to focus on the amazing people that did such amazing contributions to make this thing happen. Like George Ludwig driving 1,600 miles with Explorer 1 in his trunk. You know, these are people that embody the best of what it means to be human, to, to do whatever it takes to advance and, and grow and achieve and push past any boundaries that get in their way, including massive particle accelerators in space. So yeah, Earth's magnetic field is amazing. Who knows what this planet would be like without it. Uh, but it's just one of many amazing things in the solar system, which you can discover if you watch Secrets of the Solar System on CuriosityStream. This eight-part series takes you on a tour through our solar system, with each episode focusing on a different planet, the asteroid belt, the sun itself, and yes, even Pluto. This, of course, is just one of thousands of documentary series on Curiosity Stream from some of the best documentary filmmakers from around the world. And if you like entertaining and educational content, this is the streaming service for you. Even better, with your subscription to Curiosity Stream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite YouTube channels, where you can watch our videos ad-free. That means both pre-rolls and these sponsor messages, like you're hearing right now. And of course, Nebula is the only place where you can watch my six-part series, Mysteries of the Human Body, which covers all the weird and surprising ways that our bodies have kept us guessing over the years. We cover everything from weird and rare diseases, to common diseases we still can't cure, to famous human oddities, and the question of why we age and die. And you, dear viewer, can get both of these streaming services for 26% off, making an entire year of subscriptions of these two different streaming services at $14.79. So if you're curious, head over to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott to get started. It's seriously the best streaming deal on the planet, and I highly recommend both services. I, I enjoy both of them. So anyway, yeah, it's curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, keeping the lights on, forming an awesome community, and helping me out in so many different ways. It's awesome. So, uh, I got some people I do need to shout out real quick. Some of these are from a while back, so I apologize it's taking this long. We've got Robin M. Putnam, Hugh and Virginia Stapleton Smith, Doug Farmer, Curtis Lewis, Eric Barch, Lunar Depression, love it, Michelle Murphy, Ruth Patel, Joe Scott is a sexy man beast. That's what the guy named himself. Uh, Casey Amdahl, Inglorious Betch, uh, Andrew Giles, Liz Jolly, and Chris Lim. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos and, uh, and get uh, exclusive live streams and other cool Patreon perks, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, you can click on this video right here. Google thinks you'll like that one. Uh, or there's any of these others down on the side that you might like that have my face on them. And if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.